President Lee and uh, Dean Gabriel Long, Pro Vice Chancellor Falk and Professor uh, Lau, and also uh, Constant Chang and Sophia Chang. Nice to see you. And thank you very much. This is a great honor. Um, as Gabriel said, um, I came to Hong Kong at the age of seven, uh, 1949, on my way fleeing from China to the United States. I only spoke Chinese at the age of seven, but one year after arriving in the United States, I only spoke English. And for the rest of my life, I've been trying to relearn Chinese, but very poorly. So um, I apologize that I'm speaking in English, uh, which is really the only language that I've adopted since the age of eight. Part of the problem was that my parents were educated in the United States, and so they thought to get the children through school competitively in the U.S., they should use English at home, which was a big mistake, because then I lost to Chinese, and, uh, but my English is pretty good. <laughs> uh, uh, but uh, I now work for the China Medical Board. Um, it's an uh, old, 100-year-old foundation that has been endowed by the Rockefeller Foundation. And our mission in 1914 was to establish the Peking Union Medical College in Beijing, Shekhe. Uh, uh, we did that for the first 36 years. And then, like many foreign groups, we left China in 1950, only to return in 1980. But in those 30 years, we wandered all through the rest of Asia. So all together, over the last 100 years, we've probably invested $1.5 billion in about 120 medical schools throughout Asia, 80% of which have been in mainland China. And of course, we continue to work uh, in mainland China. We've had, as Gabriel said, a long association with, uh, with Hong Kong. Actually, you uh, at Hong Kong trained Sun Yat-sen, but he died in our hospital. So that was the, <laughs> the, the, the trade-off. Uh, <laughs> we have the honor of having conducted the autopsy for him. By the way, that was under military guard because there were real questions about why and how he died. Uh, and of course, was the pathologists were foreign pathologists and not Chinese uh, in, that, in those days. Um, also, as Gabriel mentioned, um, Richard Pierce, who was the director of medical education for the Rockefeller Foundation, very much at home in Beijing with us, also uh, came here to provide those three cheers for the Hong Kong Medical College. He was also, by the way, Gabriel, a very close friend of Prince Mahidol, who is the founder of modern medicine in Thailand. And most of the modern medical developments in Thailand coming out of Siri Raj Medical College was initiated by Richard Pierce, who uh, is remembered very fondly uh, in that country. So there's a long history. We, uh, China Medical Board provided an endowment to the Hong Kong Medical College in the 1980s. You were much wiser. We also did it for other schools. But yours, you completely absorbed into your endowment. So we have no, no fingerprints or, or traces of it. You would know where it is. Uh, but many other schools that we gave endowments to, they didn't know what to do with the endowment. And, and so they really still are figuring out what, what to do with endowment funds. This has been true, particularly true, by the way, in mainland China, where they still don't know what to do with endowment funds. Because we had the idea that the schools should be independently endowed so that they had the flexibility to move. But the Hong Kong group here has taken that endowment and put it into your general purpose uh, funds uh, very, very uh, effectively. So um, Gabriel um, very kindly um, was uh, very probably too generous to me. And I just want to indicate that I appreciated his coming to our 100th anniversary of the China Medical Board in Bangkok, in Seoul, Korea, and in Beijing only four months ago. And in Seoul, Korea, he and Professor Patel wrote a paper on the history of the Hong Kong Medical College. And that paper provides the primary source of my understanding of what's happened to medical education in Hong Kong. It's a wonderful paper that we are now editing into a, a volume. Gabriel also is a graduate of Harvard and uh, 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 like others here. And so I just want to make sure that 
I particularly cite uh, other Harvard people here. My wife, Marty Chen, who's a faculty member at the Kennedy School. Delena Wright, who's also a faculty member at the Kennedy School. And Professor Roderick McFarquhar, very close friends, who are, uh, uh, Rod is the doyen of China studies at Harvard. I think he's here as a visiting professor uh, 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 this month. And so thank you very much for joining uh, uh, the occasion. Actually, Delena um, can't stop speaking about Hong Kong because her dissertation, which is soon to be a book, is on the inside story of the British and the Chinese negotiations on the separation of Hong Kong. <laughs> and and um, I attended a very nice Harvard seminar by Delena at the Asia Center when they were discussing uh, with Ezra Vogel the, um, what the implications were in the agreements then as related to today's events. And so it was a very, very interesting set of dialogues about what was the understanding, both written but as well as uh, non-written uh, uh, communications. I um, pre prepared a lecture which I think may be too long, so I'm going to skip through things fairly quickly, but try to focus on a few key points. One of the major points I want to make is that China's healthcare system has had some successes, as Gabriel pointed out. The coverage of the population in insurance has gone from 30% to almost 95, 100%. But there are deep, deep-seated problems in the reform, and most of them relate to human and social dimensions of healthcare systems that is primarily embedded in education and the Chinese wisdom about the importance of education is nowhere more true than in the Chinese challenges today in the mainland. As a member of the China Medical Board, of course, I'm not on the inside of the mainland system, but I've been an observer for the last decade now quite closely, and as you'll see, I've worked quite closely with some of the authority figures uh, in China. But let me uh, first go through a few of them, I have to figure out how to, how to work this. Um, um. Okay, thank you, yeah. I'm, I'm technologically challenged, so there we go. Okay, this is the, um, the inauguration of the hospital at Sheikha that John D. Rockefeller Jr. attended on behalf of his father. Jr. has the hat on, okay. The other person to his right is William Welch, who is the dean of Johns Hopkins and arguably the founder of modern American medicine. He was the one that transformed American medicine into what was a semi-private German model. The person on the far left is Francis Peabody, who later became dean at Harvard Medical School. And of course, President Eliot was then of Harvard, was on the board of the Rockefeller Foundation when this mission was sent out. Um, and this is the inauguration of the Sheikha Hospital in 1921. The, uh, the buildings behind were all part of uh, Prince Yu's palace, the 10 acres that were purchased by the Rockefeller Foundation from the Qing Dynasty that still stands today as a campus, a very small campus for the medical school. This is 100 years later, four months ago, at the Great Hall of the People, the government was kind enough to organize a summit on medical education celebrating a 100th year. And the speaker there is Wendy O'Neill, who is the great-granddaughter of John D. Rockefeller, Jr. So the person you saw in that earlier photograph, this is his granddaughter, who is a member of our board of trustees. She was wonderful, by the way. She began her speech in Chinese. And I was sitting next to the minister who kept on giving me the elbow. So she was amazed. But Wendy studied for four years at Harvard Chinese. And then she came to China and she married a Chinese, actually lived in Hong Kong for many years. Uh, and Gabriel hosted her when she was uh, here for your East-West Alliance uh, 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 meeting. Um, this is uh, our board chair, Mary Bullock, who's a China historian. She's now the vice chancellor of Duke Kunshang University outside of Shanghai with Han Chida, who is the doyen of Chinese medicine, president of Peking Union Medical School and the uh, now vice chairman of the People's Political Consultative Committee. Uh, we also had the launch of our fifth Lancet series uh, to celebrate the 100th anniversary and uh, vice chairman uh, Chen Zhu of the People's Congress and former minister of health. 
uh, uh, gave the opening address at that, um, at that. We've been very proud of the series of five Lancet series on China that we have helped co-produce and co-write. So the core question I would like to you know, pose is what is happening to China's reform of the world's largest medical education system? What's been done? What are the results? Where are the gaps? Where are the opportunities? And so my presentation is going to start with a global framework. For how do you approach medical education? How do you think about it from both the a global level as well as a historical reach going back to Flexner and then look at some Chinese data particularly on undergraduate and postgraduate education and conclude by discussing some of the achievements and challenges in mainland uh, China. Um, as Gabriel pointed out of in 2010 we issued the Lancet Commission on medical education for the 21st century. I was the co-chair with Dean, Harvard Dean Julio Frank of 20 members of this global commission. And we produced this report which then looked at the experience globally of the past 100 years since the Flexner report of 2010. But I also put there the Goldmark and the Rose Welch report because those two reports set the revolution in nursing education and in public health education. And I'll explain what they did in a few uh, minutes. But basically, I wanted to show that our commission approached medical education as a structure and a process. The structure is the institutional design of the educational institutions, the medical schools and other educational institutions. And the process is the instructional design the learning and the pedagogy, and that these two vectors are very important to keep in mind. By the way, the reason I emphasize these is because the Chinese reforms recently have very much dealt with the institutional design and have under dealt with the instructional design. And I'll explain what the imbalances are generating today. But you can see the, that we really want this framework to look at the institutional design of education as well as the instructional or the learning uh, design of education. We concluded in that uh, commission report that in the last century there's been three stages of uh, transformation of medical education. The Flexner revolution in the yellow which is instruction and in the blue which is institutional was the Flexner put a modern scientific basis to the instructional content. That was the big breakthrough 100 years ago in, 20, in 1910. Of course, Hong Kong Medical School started before that with the same idea of Western science. But they also insisted, and here Hong Kong was slower and later, that the location, the institutional base of where education should take place should be in the university. By the way, all of this seems like a natural thing, but 100 years ago, it was not at all. Many physicians were trained as apprentices. There was no standardization. There was little scientific underpinning. And the universities were not the base of the educational system. So that was the transformation of science-based reform. About the mid-century, we had the problem-based reform. And that is that instead of disciplines, we went into systems and problem-based learning on the instructional side. And the growth of the hospitals led to academic centers where research, education, and service could be combined. So that was the transformation at mid-century because of the growth of the modern hospital. We argue in the commission that we're moving into a systems-based reform structure where we have to reassess the competencies that we are giving to the students because of transformations in the profile of diseases and the way patients respond in the scientific revolution and in the continuing tension between commercial and social objectives of medicine. Uh, that the competencies base have to be re-examined and that we have to align the educational and health systems together. That when there's misfits, the, neither systems work out uh, very well. So that's the basic recommendation of the commission. Um, I will not go into the detailed 
recommendations except to note that under instructional design, we argued that we have to return to a competency-based driven model and that teamwork, inter- and trans-professional education is very important. This is, by the way, very sexy in the United States right now. The Institute of Medicine has had a major set of commissions on this. And I believe that we are having a learning revolution because of the IT-empowered uh, transformation of learning, MOOCs and other kinds of learning that's taking place. And of course, the spirit of service has always been a key to the educational process. The institutional design has to synchronize education and health that we have to think in terms of systems of academics and then the networking that takes place with governance and finance. And these are very important in the China situation. And this is why I'm going upward with a global, but also historically backward, because for you to understand my analysis of the mainland Chinese system, this framework is essential. After that commission, one commissioner and I, Nigel Crisp, who headed the UK British system and I wrote an article about these major forces impacting on the future of medical education that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. And then four months ago, we published this article in The Lancet on the China system. And the data I'm presenting will come out of this paper. I should just note that Ko Yang, who is a second to the last author, is the uh, executive vice president of Peking Union Health Sciences Center and chair of the Medical Education Committee of the Ministry of Education. And Hui, uh, Lu, Lu Hui Chen is the vice minister for education, medical education. So, and that's why we got the data, by the way. <laughs> this data is not available. So, <laughs> but Lu Hui Chen decided she wanted to have this paper done. And so we were able to access all of the data on what was happening through in the Ministry of Health. And um, so we very much appreciate it. And the other Chinese authors, by the way, are all part of the uh, Ministry of Education Commission on Medical Education. They are the committee that is examining and looking at the reforms in China. So I'm an observer here as the last author, but I just wanted to let you know that this is the group in China that is in charge of medical education, basically. Okay, well, here is the China timeline, and you'll see not a uh, surprise to you that in 1912 you had the beginnings of a national system. Uh, a national health systems, uh, educational systems as well, was new for everybody in England, US, everybody. Uh, but you began and then of course in 1950 you undertook a transformation into, in mainland China, of the Soviet Union model, which are by the way functionary medical training for workers in independent institutions reporting to the Ministry of Health, not with education, not with the universities. Okay, but then you had the disruptions of the Cultural Revolution, the Barefoot Doctors, the economic opening in 1978, and then, uh, uh, you know, totally, uh, I actually with quite a bit of objections of all the medical school presidents, uh, in 1998, the educational reform was announced where all of the medical schools, the major ones, were merged into the comprehensive universities. Uh, this has generated a lot of turmoil and a lot of problems. That was a decade before the health care reform. Okay, and you'll see now, uh, as I walk through the stages of this, what, especially with the, we're going to focus on this last bit of the reform in China. But before we move to the current time, let me just show you a very interesting plot that I did of China's life expectancy in comparison to the United States in the 20th century. You can see the huge gap of 17 years in life expectancy at the beginning of the 20th century to the narrow gap of only six years at the end of the 20th century. But the huge growing gap that was much larger of 25 years in the middle of the century. China suffered enormously from chaos but then the war and, of course, the Great Famine uh, in the middle of the century. And uh, interestingly, the acceleration of life expectancy in China was during that first Soviet period in the 1950s, where there was a marked acceleration just before and after the, the Great Famine. 
uh, and that uh, in the more recent time, it's tended to plateau uh, like the United States. So, but it gives you a little bit orientation of the population health in mainland China in comparison to the United States. Well, what is the pattern of the health workers in mainland China? They have shortages, they're maldistributed, lack of primary doctors in the rural area. The educational qualification is very variable. Um, in many villages, let's say in Yunnan province, um, the village health workers, hardly any of them would have had a, even a three-year medical degree. Um, and then, interestingly, there are paradoxical production losses. Huge numbers of graduates, but not a very large share of them going into clinical practice. Many of them going to pharmaceutical companies uh, and other kinds of work. If you talk with the graduates, it's because they feel they can't find jobs. If you talk with um, uh, the people that are doing the hiring, it's because they don't feel the educational and clinical competence is high enough. And if you, of course, look at the basic statistics, you realize that um, uh, 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 there are some serious issues of the educational system in China that will not be fixed very quickly. It will take considerable time. But the 1998 reforms had these four goals. One was to integrate the medical faculty into the comprehensive universities. The second was to expand greatly the enrollment. The third was to balance the workforce. And the fourth was to emphasize more equity in health. Let me deal with the first uh, uh, area because um, uh, by 2012, 78 of the uh, medical schools had been integrated into universities. All 17 of the major medical schools, the national schools, had already been integrated with the exception of Shekha, okay, which is uh, alone with the Ministry of Health. And to some extent, China Medical University in Shenyang, that's somewhat of provincial but still not fully integrated. All of the others uh, have been integrated. And the integration is incomplete with an uncertain effect. I show here what the Chinese themselves say is happening. Some have taken on a model what they call some kind of medical autonomy within the universities, and others have been fully integrated. The medical autonomy model, like Peking University, the health faculties have been kept together under the medical school, okay, so that uh, it's been called the Health Science Center, but all the different disciplines have been brought together, including the teaching hospital, whereas in the fully integrated model, the deans of the different health sciences report to the university president. They don't report to the medical school. Okay. The alleged advantage of the fully integrated model is that collaborative multidisciplinary research and knowledge generation should be better because of the social sciences, the humanities, and other disciplines interacting with these health science faculties. But it is argued that the team teaching that's needed for the professions in providing care in an integrated healthcare system is not easily taught when the schools are not cooperating. So you have these two different views of the success of the reforms. And this is not a settled question. I would say probably the uh, bulk of the opinion in, in the Ministry of Education that controls the university is that they're moving toward the medical autonomy model. As long as they have control of the medical schools, it's okay if the medical schools consolidate a little bit within. But then you get into additional problems because when the medical schools are in the universities and the students enter by competitive examination, the assignment of the uh, specialization of the student is by test score. So now you're getting increasingly, if I'm applying to, not Beida, let's say Fudan, okay, Fudan University, and uh, I get a certain test score, I'm asked to rank my favorite fields. Usually engineering and business is ahead of medicine, not like Hong Kong. Hong Kong is, and this is really, by the way, this is, will have a very profound effect. So what's happening is about 17% now of the students in the medical schools 
in these elite universities did not list medicine as their first choice. They've ended up there by their test scores because they didn't get accepted into engineering or into business or one of the other preferred professions. The hypothesis is that this could lead to, obviously, hazards with regard to how much the students care when they enter and when they leave about the dedication to service. And this is getting now closer to the heart of where the educational system links across to the healthcare system. Because as I go through later, the healthcare system is on emerging and getting close to a crisis in terms of the breakdown between <coughs> the provider, the professional, and the patient. And people don't know quite what the reasons are for it, but one of the explanations is the educational process in China. There are other reasons which I'll go through when I get to that portion of the talk. But this is why this area of the, what is called the institutional design in China that's shifted since 1998 is so important for the performance of the healthcare system. The other is the expansion. This shows you the number of students and the number of faculty. The students are blue, the faculty is red, and the ratio of, uh, of uh, uh, faculty to students is the green. And not surprisingly, what's, ha what's happened is that the enrollments have exploded, but the number of faculty has not. And neither has then the facilities nor the funding, nor the public funding. So the faculty and the investment ratios per student has plummeted. And this now obviously is another area of great concern as to what the quality is of the products that are coming out. Here is the 2012 graduating class. The three clinical medicine bars on the left are three-year, five-year, and eight-year medical graduates by the thousands. So altogether, you have about 170,000, um, um, 160,000 clinical graduates in medicine. Okay, and then you have this huge bolus of nurses that are coming out now. This is a, a total acceleration that had not been there before. Uh, and um, then a very low number of public health uh, providers um, that are mostly actually bachelor <coughs> graduates. So this is the, the pattern of the 2012 graduates. And here is the summary <coughs> of the uh, uh, 1998 reforms. On the institutional design was the integration to universities, the expansion of institutions, and the increase in enrollments. By the way, the expansion of institutions, some of the smallest schools at the provincial level grouped together to combine and become a larger school, but they also upgraded themselves. So if they were a secondary school, they would call themselves now a junior college. If they were a junior college, they would call themselves a college without any change in the faculty or the resource level. But the, con but the consolidation enabled them to claim higher levels of educational att attainment. So you had that on the institutional design. But on the instructional design in China, the curriculum has not changed. Uh, the faculty and the facilities and the pedagogy has not changed. And then, as I said, the admissions has changed with now students entering who did not rank medicine as their first choice. They may be very smart in test taking, but they didn't want to be doctors. So the achievements are there are more graduates to improve the shortage situation. They've increased massively the number of nurses in China, uh, so the doctor-nurse ratio has improved. They've given scholarships for rural deployment because of their concern about primary care and rural equity. And it's uncertain whether the integration in the universities has led to the interdisciplinary research that uh, uh, many aspire to. What about postgraduate education? The biggest has been the so-called Excellent Doctor 5 plus 3 program. This is an attempt to standardize medical education in China to five years. That's very similar to Hong Kong. Uh, and then have three years of clinical uh, training with an exam and also certification. This is just getting started. It's not quite clear how this will play out. Um, and then uh, there's also now moves. I won't go into this in detail except to note that 
China recognizes that its residency and specialization training is backward. And it, there are very few specialization uh, endorsement groups, like your Academy of Medicine uh, here. The, um, uh, lack of, the problems are lack of standardization. Uh, every resident is, stays in one hospital. Every professor stays only in one hospital. There's no mobility. That's also, you have a problem with that here in Hong Kong. <laughs> um, and then there are ver not strong professional organizations. Uh, this, I think, is a big question for China, is whether the question of professional standards, professional ethos, professional uh, uh, gatekeeping and uh, quality standards is a government function or is to be left to the professions. In Hong Kong, you've adopted the more uh, British system of having the professions police itself to a large extent. I think that's what your Academy of Medicine does. Um, not completely, because I know that you also need some of your legal and other systems to do some of that policing. But um, um, uh, I have at the bottom the, the hospital violence, and this is the, 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 the symptom that's now causing huge concerns because 80% of the hospitals in China report incidents of violence last year. The, in, the incidence of violence has been increasing at about 50% a year in the hospitals. The security in the hospitals has been more than doubled. In fact, there's been regulations put out about the security control of the hospital. This, and what are the explanations for it? Well, immediately people say, well, the system is not exactly above the table because three quarters of the a physician income is earned as gray or black income. So it's not the government salary, but it's got to be the drugs and the tests. The second is the Chinese saying three hours of wait for three minutes with the doctor. So the waiting time is three hours. Uh, doctors are seeing anywhere from uh, 50 to 100 patients a, a day. That's due to the fact that there's a tertiary swamping going on. Anybody who's sick wants to go to Shekha and they queue up in Shehe every morning, 20,000 patients turnover. There's no primary care uh, system. Now in Hong Kong, I think you have a primary clinic-based system, don't you? Uh, somewhat, <laughs> somewhat. <laughs> but in China, uh, people will get on trains and go immediately to the tertiary facility. And so they become overloaded. Now. These are some of the symptoms of what the hospitals are uh, facing with the violence. But many others attribute the violence to the educational process because with the lack of inculcation of the uh, social sciences, the humanities, ethics, communications with the patients, it's uh, a public health and understanding of health conditions, the graduates that are coming out are not really equipped to deal with the um, uh, um, uh, uh, situation. So I'm going to uh, pretty much finish up here. Um, uh, let me just conclude by saying there have been tangible achievements of reducing shortages, better skill mix, and so forth. But obviously challenges, the journey is quite incomplete. It's very important to think why China has reformed its medical education system. Why do they do it? Well, one, of course, is they want to improve better health. They want to have better health professionals. The second is economic. They want a better health system because they need to balance the social development. They need to increase the consumption in health and education as opposed to just the export industry. And the third is political. The uh, violence in the hospitals now is in the press every week in China. And um, the vice premier, the minister, uh, they're all badgered by this as to how can we fix this? And they're asking, how can we fix this? And of course, they immediately go back to the educational process that's being uh, inculcated. I think one of the lessons in China, which they will have to address, is how do you balance the institutional design, which is what the 1998 reform has dramatically changed, with the instructional design. You cannot just take one and massively shift it 
without also dealing, you can't deal with the hardware without dealing with the software uh, effectively. Because ultimately healthcare is a human service and it depends on the people and the professionals. It's not just drugs, it's not just financing, it's really a service industry. So your cadre of workers and how they relate to their patients and the population is the key pillar of the healthcare uh, system. The, and then finally, China has really been struggling with this question of excellence, which is what the integration in the universities was for, versus equity, which is what generating primary physicians for the rural areas is for. And by the way, Mao, Mao had a view on that. He thought he would change all of the professions with the Barefoot Doctors Movement for equity. Now since 1978, the Chinese are moving toward excellence. Um, the healthcare, uh, particularly the R&D in pharmaceutical and diagnostic tests, is one of the seven cutting edge industries that the 12th year plan is promulgating. So this is very much seen as an economic and R&D uh, industry. Uh, and how it will deal with the equity questions is a continuing uh, uh, attention. I was going to talk a little bit about Hong Kong, but I think I won't, excepting just to say that we did, I did do a comparison of Hong Kong's undergraduate and postgraduate and say that there's some alignment, but obviously they're very different. You're both moving into five-year systems on the undergraduate level, but clearly at the postgraduate level, you have big, big differences. And then finally, um, when I read Gabriel and Niv's uh, Patel's paper on Hong Kong Medical College, I noted that in 1871, Patrick Mason, in his inaugural speech, in the launching of the medical college, said that the medical college should not only graduate people to serve Hong Kong, but it was to serve all of China. It was to lead health improvements in the whole country. And I think one of the questions for you all here is what is the role of Hong Kong and the Hong Kong Medical College for all of China? You have immediately the interactions, and I've put here, I won't go into the flow of students, faculty, services, patients, professionals, and the products that are moving back and forth. I know the baby food is going that way, and uh, you know, you'll be getting lots of flows that are going back and forth. That's an immediate, that's an immediate interaction. And by the way, it's a useful service for the mainland because those are operating according to people's desires and forces. But the long-term question is convergence. Is there going to be one country and one system, or is there going to be one country and two systems? And here, I think the full convergence is going to be very tough, even though the culture, the language, and I should say the politics is very similar. But you have different systems different professions, compensation, quality, and different uh, regulation. I should say, however, that the politics is very worrying because in the sole workshop that Gabriel and I attended, we looked at the medical education system in Japan, Hong Kong, Taiwan, Korea, and over the 20th century. And we noted that the political system dictated the transformation of the medical education system in each and every one of those countries. So in other words, Japan adopted some of the German system, but when it was colonizing Korea and Taiwan, it exported the Japan system. After World War II, Korea and Taiwan adopted the American system. China, on its own, adopted the Soviet system. Now on its own, it's adopting the American system. You all are very lucky here in Hong Kong. You've had 100 years, and you've had essentially a beverage-like healthcare system with a very steady educational system that has deep roots in an international Chinese mixture that's uh, taken place. And what I was going to argue for is that you're going to have to enter into a process of networking for shared learning with the mainland that can have positive returns for both uh, territories. So thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Chen.